right. Let's get started. Yes. Does anybody have any idea what you can see on the picture behind me? Wave your hand or shout if you know it. Okay, shout louder because uh, I'm not hearing you yet. Control room, yes. What were you saying? Police, yeah, yeah, sure. Any, any other ideas? This is the uh, emergency room of the Dutch police in The Hague. So whenever you call the emergency number, uh, it's 112 in the Netherlands. Um, here are the fire brigade, the police, and the ambulance to help you with your uh, emergency call. So this room is one of the locations that um, my teams at the police are building software uh, for. So my name is bert Schrijver. I work at Open Value, which is a small Java startup in the Netherlands. But since the startup world is so hard, I need to work two jobs. So we also work at JPoint, which is a, a Java consultancy uh, shop. Uh, my current assignment is at the uh, Dutch Police. Uh, and I also run the NLJUG, the Dutch Java Use Group. So do you have any members from the NLJUG in the room? <laughs> All right, one. Thanks for the support, uh, Brian. So for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to um, share, uh, I'm going to start with a short introduction about what I'm going to talk about, set the stage. Uh, talk about how we handle methodology, how we handle culture, what type of methodology we use, um, the architecture that, that we've built stuff on and the platform we use, uh, how we build and test our front end. Obviously, we have a back end uh, too. How we develop and test stuff, how we build stuff, how we deploy, and how we run and monitor it in production. And I'll end with the challenges we've had and, and by looking ahead on stuff we'd still like to work on. So, so a short disclaimer first, I'm, I'm not presenting a best practices talk. I'm just sharing how we work and what works for us. Uh, it might, for, might work for you too, it might not, it always depends. I'm going to share uh, a lot of stuff from, uh, from different angles. Um, I, I, w I uh, will not really go in depth because I don't have time to do so, but you're free to, to ask me afterwards to, to reach out on, on Twitter. So I'm going to uh, share uh, everything about how we work and the technology uh, that my team uses. I'm going to tell nothing about the type of system we use and what they're used for. But obviously, you're always free to use your imagination. So the Dutch Police is a, a fairly large organization, about 65,000 people, of which about 1,500 work, uh, work in IT. Uh, so how many of you uh, have been to the Netherlands before? OK, well, which cities did you visit? Okay, shout, please. Did anybody go to Amsterdam? Okay, so I, I won't be asking you questions about what you did in Amsterdam. Uh, it's a nice city. Yeah, you know, there's lots of stuff to, to find out there. Uh, is any, any of you familiar with the Dutch police? <laughs> <laughs> There's one guy up front here. Okay, I won't ask you anything about that, uh, too. So I work at the uh, product line Cloud Big Data Internet. Uh, where a couple of teams are, are building fairly high-tech high stuff in a, a private cloud we're building ourselves. Uh, and we are building uh, applications that support various police-related teams. So that's about what I'm going to share. Uh, and we do everything uh, ourselves, so uh, development, maintenance, uh, support. And what I'm going to share is about how our department works. It's not how the entire police works. Uh, we're about uh, 30 people. So let's start by diving into a bit of uh, methodology. So as I said, we have uh, five teams, and those, those teams have separate backlogs. So what they always like is one team, one product owner, one backlog, because then you'll never uh, have any um, uh, arguments about what to work on. Uh, we, our sprints are synchronized, so whenever we, we start a new sprint, uh, we have an overall, overall planning with, um, the, uh, with, with the teams to see if there are any dependencies between the teams. And our planning ritual is, is fairly minimal. So. Um, this might offend you if you're kind of a scrum purist, but we, we don't really use story points to, to estimate stories and to, to measure velocity. We only use story points as a, um, a way of determining how many work will fit in a sprint. So what we do when we do planning poker, when we estimate our stories, we say that one, one story point equals one uh, man day of work. And since the teams are fairly comparable in terms of productivity, this, this works for us. So then we estimate stories to either one or two or three or five days of work. Whenever we start planning for a sprint, we ask around the team, like, how many days will you be available for this sprint? We add this up to a number, and then we start filling the sprint with stories until we reach this number. And this works fairly well, but we only use it as a tool to uh, predict how much work will fit in the sprint. 
and we, we try to measure productivity in other terms. For example, uh, how happy our, our, um, our customers or our users are. We try to uh, make usability tests part of our sprints. So we ask people from the field, and in, in our case, it's, I think it's a bit easier than when you're making a public product, um, because we know who our end users are. They, they, they must be any of those 65 people in the 65,000 um, people in the police organization. So we can just ask them, uh, some key users, please come in uh, and take a look at the new version of the system we've built and, and tell us uh, what you think of it. Uh, use it and see if it works for you. So we try to make those usability tests parts of our sprints. We try to minimize the amount of meetings we have. Uh, so obviously we have the, the, um, the scrum cyclers with uh, uh, planning and, and retro and demo and refinements to, to refine use stories. But other than that, uh, almost no meetings. Um, since we've, we've grown from, from one team to five, uh, we, we did saw the necessity to build some uh, cross-team uh, structures. So we've, we've um, set up a couple of guilds, for example, the front-end development guild, the uh, security guild, the performance guild, where people from different teams have regular meetings, like one every two weeks, to discuss uh, like cross-cutting concerns that, that go over all teams. For example, something like security is something that you can easily uh, forget in your own sprint. So when there's a, a different uh, group of people that will have, have a specific focus on security, uh, you make sure that you'll spend time on this uh, at, at the right, uh, right time. We use Fabricator to do our project administration. So I'm curious, how many of you have heard of Fabricator before? Okay, a couple. Uh, Fabricator is like, um, you could call an open source clone of the Atlassian uh, suite. Um, although the last time I said this, somebody tweeted it, and then somebody uh, replied angrily on Twitter, no, that's not true, we had code review first. And I was like, I'm curious who's saying this. And this turned out to be one of the developers of Fabricator. So I cannot call it an open source uh, uh, Atlassian Suite clone, but it's comparable. It has a wiki, it has uh, issue tracking, it has tasks, it has code review, and you can do uh, mockups uh, in there. It's a fairly uh, complete open source uh, suite. It's used uh, by, I think it was created at Facebook. It's used by Facebook, by Dropbox, Dropbox by Pinterest. So if you're looking for uh, an open source solution to, to do your product administration in, I can recommend it. So let's talk about culture. Uh, we, we like the, the values of continuous delivery and, and DevOps. So continuous delivery meaning um, we try to uh, build and test our software in such a way that it's always in a releasable state. And DevOps meaning uh, that we have uh, development engineers, operations engineers, and other IT professionals being responsible together for the entire life cycle of, of our products. We try to focus on keeping feedback, lo feedback loops as short as possible. So whenever we do something, we want to hear something back as quickly as possible. So either automate it, when we, we push something and a build starts running and, and tests uh, start running, or uh, not automate it, but for my users. So we, we try to, um, to keep these loops as short as possible while actively involving our users in giving feedback uh, and obviously releasing um, uh, in, in short periods to production so we can actively get feedback from our users. We try to embrace change. So we know that the world is, is going to be different tomorrow. So we, we better, we, we rather make the wrong choice today than make no choice at all. So one quote that I like, I think, is from one of the founders from Nintendo. As he said, uh, I reserve the right to wake up smarter tomorrow. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, uh, we, we believe it's okay if we start building something now, we experiment a little, and then we see that's not going to work. It's all right to throw it away and start something over again, uh, as long as we don't spend too, too much time. And I think this is vital for our speed as, an, as part of a, a larger organization. We try to minimize and, if possible, cut off all dependencies we have outside our department. Because if we depend on somebody else in the organization to do stuff for us that, that we need to progress, then we, we can't control this person. So we can't control the, the speed uh, at, at which this happens. So we try to uh, keep as much um, of the stuff we need to do to get from ID to working software in production, keep it inside our team. Uh, and this enables us to uh, move fairly fast within uh, a fairly large organization. We invest in people. We don't buy products. So everything we use is open source and free to use. And we try to hire smart and driven people to help us with these open source tools. And we uh, try to be open and transparent and verifiable. So the police is a public organization, so we, we are paid by uh, uh, the Dutch people. 
so we try to be verifiable and, and transparent in the things we do. So we regularly have people over from, uh, for example, from universities or from uh, 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 public organizations who uh, concern themselves with privacy. And we also share some of the stuff we're building on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash police, which is Dutch for police, you'll find some of the stuff we've built there, for example, uh, Jenkins pipelines and, and stuff like that. So we have five teams, and these teams are responsible for doing everything from idea to working software in production. We don't have separate um, uh, management or um, maintenance uh, teams. How do we handle support and maintenance during our sprints? Because that's something that we, we, we also need to work on. So we've made this a role that cycles throughout the team. So everybody in the team is on duty maybe one day in a week, or one day every two weeks. And, and we call this the... Uh, the um, well, the, the name of the team of the day. So we have five teams, and these teams used to have um, descriptive names. So one team was more focused on platform, one more on backend, and one more on front end. But we noticed that didn't really work well, because then uh, if somebody uh, who was working in the front end team needed something, then they need to walk to the back end uh, team. So now we've made the teams more cross-functional and gave them names that don't have any meaning. So they're all shades of blue. We have the Cobalt team, the Indigo team, the Sapphire team, and a couple of others. So uh, if you are, for example, the Cobalt of the day, it means that you have the support role for the Cobalt team this day. So you handle support calls that come in, uh, you take a look at our monitoring systems, and also try to improve the observability of our systems. So for example, uh, logging. Uh, we, we actively work on improving the, um, uh, the logging that our application does. So try to go through the logs in production, all the uh, logging that, handle, that uh, goes on info level and higher, and see is this logging useful. If there's a logging statement, uh, is it a problem? If so, uh, do I need to act on it? If not, why am I logging it? Uh, if I need to act on it, okay, fix it, and then the logging should go away. Uh, if it's not clear what I need to do, then I need to improve the logging. Uh, so uh, go to my IDE, open a project, improve the logging, uh, push it, and if it's important, move to production right away. So I kind of call this like log gardening. We actively work to keep the logging uh, useful. Uh, so on a regular day, uh, some of our applications may serve, I don't know, a million records or so, and typically there are only a handful of error logs uh, in, in those one million uh, requests. Uh, and this helps keeping the logs useful, because if you have a million requests and there are 10 million error messages, nobody's going to look at it. So let's talk about arch architecture uh, a bit. These are architecture principles, and the, the good thing with principles is that you're, you're allowed to derive from, from them or, or make them an end goal. So we're, we're not there yet for all these principles, but we, we try to, to work on them. So obviously, when you work at the police, security and encryption is important. So we try to uh, encrypt from, from end to end, so from the browser of the end user all the way to the final point in our data center. Everything is in version control, which helps in knowing who did what and when, and, and obviously reverting things. I want to be scalable, uh, so everything needs to scale out. We're the big data department, so we typically handle big uh, data workloads. Uh, so that everything needs to be horizontally scalable, and we can't have any single points of failure, because then only one thing can break, and then we're, we're out. I think this is one of the most important things. Uh, we, we can't have any runtime dependencies on, on external systems, systems that we don't control. For example, if we, we, we have a fair amount of um, mapping functionality in our applications. Uh, we can't rely on Google Maps there because uh, if there's a, like a big, big problem in the, internet, in the internet in the Netherlands and, I don't know, uh, the, the police network is being uh, dosed uh, and we can't reach Google Maps, then we don't know where the problems are. So we've, we've built our own mapping solution based on uh, vector-based vector OpenStreetMap data. And I would say that this is actually better than Google Maps, but that's probably because we've, we've built ourselves. Um, but our systems need to keep running whenever the internet in the Netherlands is, 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 is in flames and, and halfway down. So this is important for us that, uh, obviously, you can use Google Maps in our application if you, if you like it, but if not, there should always be a fallback to something that doesn't depend on something that we don't control. We standardize on naming. This, this seems small, a small thing, but it's actually fairly big because uh, this really helps in, in finding stuff and automating stuff. So if we know the name of uh, the, the part of the domain, for example, it's, I don't know, geo-information, um, and we know the type of component that we're looking for, so we have uh, services, connectors, uh, sinks, stuff like that. Let's say it's a service, and we know that the name is service-geo. 
uh, the Git project is called service-geo. The build is called service-geo. The URL for the dev environment is service-geo.dev.something. Uh, so this really helps in terms of finding stuff, but also in automating, because now it's easy to create scripts uh, that only need to fill in a, a couple of variables. We reserve uh, to choose the right tool for the job. And as a result, we're fairly polyglot now. So we now have um, software written in uh, Java, in TypeScript, C, Ruby, Groovy, PHP, Scala, JavaScript, Python, Go, Perl, and Kotlin. So is this a good thing? I wouldn't necessarily say so. But, it, but we have reasons. Uh, for example, most of the stuff is in Java for the backend and Kotlin for the, for the frontend. Um, sorry, the TypeScript for the frontend. Uh, then we have some C for some low-level network stuff. Uh, Ruby because of Puppet scripts, I think. Groovy because of Jenkins pipelines. PHP because of some legacy application. Scala because of the Gatling DSL. JavaScript, I don't know. Python because of some operations uh, scripts. Go because somebody wanted to learn Go. Uh, Perl because of some operation scripts. And Kotlin because, well, come on, Kotlin. Um, but the, 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 the big batch is, is Java and, and TypeScript. So I need to warn you because I'm, we're going to talk about architecture. And you know, these architecture diagrams are typically large and there are lots of boxes and lines uh, and colors and maybe even icons if you're, if you're lucky. So don't be surprised. Here's an architecture diagram. Uh, so let me, let me walk you through this. So it all starts at, at the bottom. We're, we're running on uh, a, a private cloud we're building ourselves. So these are machines somewhere in a police data center. And we're using uh, OpenStack uh, as a, a cloud software and Ceph as distributed storage. I'll tell a bit more about that uh, later. So it all starts at the right where we ingest data sources. This can be content from uh, the web, maybe tweets, Instagram, mapping data, some other online sources, and obviously data from internal systems uh, too. So we store the original data of everything we, we fetch. Uh, so we can also always access the original uh, raw data that we fetched whenever we you know, need to prove something to, to someone. So these um, data sources are fetched by applications we call connectors. And the sole goal of a connector is to pull data from some remote source. So this can be a connector to fetch geo information, for example. And a connector typically uh, puts a message on a Kafka topic. So how many of you have experience with Kafka? Okay, about half. So, so you could see Kafka as a distributed uh, messaging system or, or queue. It's fairly high performance and scalable. So we use it uh, to um, decouple uh, reading and writing sites from our, uh, from our system. So, and also to handle stuff like, like back pressure, where we're pulling in data faster than we can uh, uh, process uh, behind Kafka. So these connectors are pulling in data and putting messages on Kafka topics. Depending on the size of the data, it can either be the full message on a Kafka topic or a pointer to the original data stored on Ceph somewhere. And on the other side, we're using um, also Spring applications that are built using uh, Kafka streams. So these connect as a consumer to Kafka and then process the data. So we, we could have put all this in, in, in a single application, but when, because we have Kafka in between, we get a couple of uh, advantages. Uh, we can scale independently, so we can have more consumers than we have producers. Uh, we can easily restart the consumers here. We won't lose, lose messages because Kafka will, will queue them for us. And we can even replay. So you can, can set like a, a retention period on Kafka. So whenever something breaks, we can replay, for example, the past day of messages to put it again through our pipeline. So the stream jobs, it, it still says Spark here. We moved away from Spark because we had a lot of trouble keeping the Spark cluster up and running. So now it's just simple Kafka consumers that we deploy as Spring Boot applications. And these streams jobs, they write to, to data stores, and these data stores tend to be uh, optimized for the goal wherever we, we use them for. So they're used by services, and these are typical Spring Boot applications that handle REST requests from end users, read something from the data store, and serve it back to the front end. Uh, so Elasticsearch, whenever a search is important, Cassandra, when maybe writing is important to store user data, MongoDB, when it's document-oriented, MySQL because we migrated a legacy application that had a MySQL database and we didn't feel like uh, uh, migrating the database. Then as a front end, a couple of fronts actually that we've built with Angular. Uh, these are being used in the browser and on some mobile devices. So we have an LDAP server where all the user information is in and we are currently halfway migrating from using uh, Kerberos for authentication. So Kerberos is fairly old school and has some 
interesting um, uh, characteristics to uh, putting a key cloak in between. So key cloak is an open source, you could call it a, 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 um, IAM provider. And with key cloak, we can easily connect multiple authentication sources. So either a Kerberos token or maybe OAuth or maybe login with username and password. And our, our security model is um, delegation. So whenever a user makes a call through a browser to a service, and the service needs to call not a service, then this call is done on behalf of the end user. So we, we forward the credentials of the user. So with every call, even if a user calls a service which calls another service which calls another service, it's still as if the service was called directly by the end user. So this makes the security model fairly simple. We always know that a call is done on behalf of the end user. There are no system accounts or God accounts. Um, it makes it fairly simple for us to uh, keep security simple and to, to trace who is doing what where. So let's talk about platform a bit. So as I said, we, we are uh, running on OpenStack, which is an open source uh, uh, cloud solution, uh, Ceph for distributed storage. And uh, Ceph is um, uh, being used, for example, by, by CERN, where the Hadron Collider uh, is. Uh, it's a distributed storage system where you can um, create a, like a big storage solution of hundreds or thousands of disks. So whenever uh, a machine boots up, the compute and memory resources go to OpenStack and the storage resources go to uh, Ceph. And Ceph takes care of uh, replication, so all the data is re replicated in three places and rebalancing whenever something, uh, something fails. So what do we do with this cloud? We provide general cloud services for the police organization. Again, you're free to use your imagination. So we're currently uh, growing towards about 500 servers, a couple of thousand virtual servers, around 24 petabytes of storage, and we're about halfway there, I would say. And we're kind of like playing our own cloud provider, which sounds fun, uh, until you notice that you need, of 30 people, one person full-time working on networking. Uh, peerings, firewalls, VPMs, uh, uh, network connections. So it's playing your own cloud, cloud provider sounds fun, but in, in practice it's a lot of work. So if I could choose between building my own cloud or just taking my credit card and going to, to Amazon or Google or Azure, uh, if I had the choice, I would definitely choose the latter one. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we have a couple of thousand desktops that we manage. And uh, their automation starts whenever something boots. So be it a server or a desktop or a switch, as soon as it boots, we start provisioning it. Uh, so that's the only way that we can uh, manage this amount of machines with only a small group of people. So if you have hundreds of physical servers and 14 disks per server, uh, stuff is going to break every now and then. It's not a matter if the stuff breaks, but when it breaks. So let me, let me tell you a couple of stories about uh, this. Um, so we, um, we've automated uh, lots of uh, health checks on, on machines. For example, uh, of, on all those disks, we're monitoring the smart values. And whenever we see uh, 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 smart failures, then uh, so, so smart again is a mechanism that uh, hard drives expose. So whenever we see a smart failure, we can, with some certainty, detect that the disk is broken. Then we automatically create a ticket to the people who work in the data center uh, so that they start uh, working to replace the disk for us. And because the data is replicated over, over um, uh, multiple uh, drives, uh, we can easily replace those, those drives. So um, it happens that because it's all automated, it, we typically don't know that there are people working to replace uh, disk. We have it on a ticket system somewhere, but it, it's all automated. So it happens that our support, for, uh, uh, support phone rings, and uh, it's somebody in the data center saying, yeah, so you called, uh, you, you made this ticket that we need to replace uh, a disk. And they were like, all oh, right, yeah, probably, probably we, we did this. Yeah, so uh, I'm from this machine, but I forgot which disk it is. So can you, can you tell me which disk it is? Okay, do you know the service stack of the machine, which is like a small sticker that's on there, and then we can uh, find the IP address, log into it, and see which disk is broken. So, yeah, it's a second disk. Okay, thanks. So is it the second disk from the top left or the second disk from the bottom right? <laughs> we don't know. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the second disk from the top left. All right, here we go. Healthy disk disappears. Oh, no, that wasn't the right one. Put it back. Okay, disk back. Second one from the top left, yeah, that's the broken one. But as I said, because the data is, is distributed, um, uh, whenever we lose a disk, it's, it's usually not a problem. Ceph just starts rebalancing, and then uh, in no time, the data is still distributed in three places again. So we once had a failure that where we lost a significant portion of the data center, uh, and the Ceph needed to rebalance for a couple of hours, but afterwards it was all good. We didn't have any downtime and no lost data. 
Another thing is uh, we, um, we have this thing in my team where, where something happens. We try to find suitable music for the occasion. So one of my colleagues was working and, and he turns on this song. I think it was uh, It's Getting Hot In Here by, by Nelly. So I look at him like, what's going on? And he has this fake smile on his face. Uh, and he picks up the phone, he calls somebody in the data center. And he said, yeah, so you, you did some maintenance on this and that server, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. So um, are you sure that you put all the parts back in? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Did you also put back in these small fans that are in front of the, of the, like the, the strip you put over the machine? I think I'm going to have to call you back. So what we did is we noticed that the, the temperature of this machine was, was, was going up. So we had some alerts going off, and it turned out that somebody forgot to put some fans uh, back in. Uh, but, you know, as long as you're, you're working on, on having your data replicated and, and, and clustered, then you're, you're typically good in this situation. So how do we manage this? Uh, hundreds of servers, thousands of desktops, and thousands of virtual servers. Uh, obviously, by automating it. So we are big fans of... of seeing our infrastructure as code. So we use Terraform to uh, connect to the OpenStack API to provision machines, um, Puppet to control our servers, Ansible to control desktops, and we're currently also moving to working a bit more with Docker and containers where we, do, we make pre-built images and roll out those. So let's take a look at our front end. Um, I would say it's a fairly typical mono front end, so we use Angular 6 and TypeScript and RGS. So how many of you are uh, Java developers? Okay, uh, how many of you are Java developers but didn't raise your hand? Oh, there are actually people, okay, no, no worries. So uh, I think Angular is awesome when you're a Java developer because uh, now with TypeScript you can write properly typed code in the browser. So there's like classes and interfaces and, and even generics, so I love working with TypeScript. RxJS is awesome for doing asynchronous uh, stuff. So we have Angular for the HTML uh, templates, TypeScript for uh, the, the business logic, and RxJS for the asynchronous stuff. What are we missing? Something that Java developers typically aren't really good at. Oh, come on, you know it. Yeah. CSS, yes. So there's this thing called CSS for Java developers, which is bootstrap. Uh, so, so we've been using bootstrap extensively to kind of factor away all the, the nitty-gritty CSS details. Currently, we're also looking into Angular Material because Material integrates fairly well with the Angular CLI, so it's fairly easy to, to generate new components uh, using Angular Material. Uh, some responsive design in there to, to run on multiple uh, devices. We try to make the front end fail uh, uh, gracefully whenever the back end fails. So when, when one back end service is failing, only the, the, the part of the front end that's connected to that part of the back end should fail and the rest of the system should still be usable. So we, we also try to test uh, this to make sure that whenever something fails, only a little part of the front end fails and the rest is still usable. And we had a situation every now and then that we were thinking, oh wow, it's nice and quiet, no errors in our logging system. And then uh, in reality, uh, all the connected browsers were continuously spewing out errors to their console because we made some front-end programming error and we weren't receiving any requests to the back-end. So what we've done is, is uh, reroute all uh, console logs that happen in the browser, so console.log or error, send it to a REST endpoint, which then goes to our centralized logging solution. So we now also know what's going on in all the connected browsers. But beware, this is a, a nice res recipe to uh, perform a denial of service attack on yourself. Uh, whenever something breaks and it starts spamming to the console log, make sure you have some throttling in there. Uh, for example, when you have 10,000 repeating messages, it's better to write one message to your log system that says repeat it 10,000 times than to write 10,000 log messages to your log system. So every now and then we're building something and, and it takes a bit longer than one sprint to, to build it. Uh, or maybe something that we want to test uh, uh, on a separate environment before we reach the production. So how do we de decouple building something from releasing it and deploying it? So we, we use feature toggles for this. How many of you have heard of feature toggles before? Okay, about half. Uh, so feature toggles basically like an if statement in your code that is uh, controlled by uh, either a centralized server or configuration file. So what we typically do is we build something new, we build a feature toggle around it, and then we say, all right, this is enabled on the development environment, it's enabled on the acceptance environment, but, but not in production, for example. And this allows us to, to um, stay away from keeping uh, long-running feature branches, but just merge everything to master, deploy it to production, but not enable this feature yet. 
So uh, we have a nice backend running with microservices, and uh, we're building a front-end. And how do we prevent that we are now integrating everything in front-end and creating a monolithic front-end? So we didn't. Uh, so we, we built one big front-end that was calling all the microservices in the backend, and we're now trying to apply the principle of microservices to, uh, to our front-end too. So splitting it up in different parts, try to find uh, stuff that we can reuse. So we've now created a couple of uh, front-end components that are standalone projects, so you can just check them out and, uh, and, and run them, and uh, there's, a, there's a demo in there, uh, and um, these components build as libraries, and we can reuse these libraries in our front-end projects. So stuff that we often do, we try to keep those in, in components, and then reuse those components in the front-end, but the front-end is still the place where we integrate all the different parts. So let's talk about the backend uh, a bit. Um, but first, let's dive into microservices, because I said I was going to talk about microservices. We're in 30 minutes now, and uh, I'm only starting now. So microservices are typically small. It is one thing. Uh, it is one thing uh, well. Uh, it runs in its own process, and therefore you can independently develop it. You can upgrade it. You can scale it. Uh, I think microservices should have its own data store. Uh, it's typically distributed. Otherwise, it's not of much use. And it can be polyglot, so you can use multiple languages for different services. We've started doing this by introducing a bit of Kotlin, but most of it is still Java. And they better have some form of lightweight communication, because you're going to communicate a lot. So did we start building microservices uh, right away when we started? Uh, no, we didn't. So why did we do? Uh, I think there are two reasons. First was scalability. So we both want to scale different parts of our system independently, but also we want to scale the amount of teams. If you are working on one repository with five teams, chances are that you will uh, hurt each other somewhere, uh, uh, conceptually, not actually hurting each other. Modularity also. So we want to have uh, independent development of different parts and independently deploy them. If you have a system that's consisting of one million lines of code and you change one, then it, uh, it's typically better to deploy only one line or maybe 10 or 100 lines of code than just deploy the entire system. And microservices were becoming cool. We wanted, to, we wanted to be cool, so obviously the cool factor helped, uh, helped a bit. So how do we go there? Uh, well, no shocker there, we, we split our system system up. So we, we tried to look to the, um, the ideas given by uh, domain-driven design. Um, one of the ideas is a bounded context. So domain-driven design says you, uh, it's, it's, when your system is large enough, it's impossible to create one unified model for your entire system because a, uh, I don't know, a customer can, or, or a client can be different in, in one part or another part of the system, or an order, for example. So um, when you work in bounded context, you're saying it's all right to have different models for different parts of the system, as long as you're very clear about the boundaries of those uh, parts and the interactions between those boundaries. So what are the interfaces between different parts of the system? This maps fairly well to a microservice. You can have different implementations within every service, as long as you're clear at, about the contracts between services. So for each model we defined, um, so where each module was um, kind of similar to, to one bounded context, we created a service, and then for every service check, is it now only one part of domain, or are there multiple parts of domain in there? Uh, if there's only one part, we're really good. If not, we, we should split it up uh, more. So did we split up everything from, from the start uh, all the way in, in small components? Uh, well, th there was a bit too much work. So we started out with taking the easy parts, uh, something that's obviously a service that is maybe easy to take the code out. And uh, then there was some code that was a bit entangled that was hard to split up, so we kept that in, in one last service. And then uh, over time, whenever we need to change something in that service, we would take out that part, put that part in a new service, and deploy that new service. So it actually took about two or two and a half years until we had finally split it up the last part of the previous known uh, monolith. And this was something like the, the logic to send emails when somebody had feedback on the system or something. So something that we, that we didn't touch in two years. So let's take a look at our backend. Um, we've recently moved to Spring Boot 2, so we're also using uh, Webflux for the reactive stuff. Uh, Java and Kotlin, a little bit of Kotlin, mostly Java and Maven. Uh, they are stateless, which is uh, necessary when you want to scale out over multiple services, so we, we don't store any state in memory in our services. We have one service running in, in one jar in one JVM, and there's one Git project, so we have lots and lots of Git projects, about 150, I think. And we try to not share too much code between services. We used to do this in the beginning, which didn't really work, because this was creating all kinds of dependencies. dependencies. 
So we're only sharing stuff that we need in every service. Security, authentication, authorization, uh, and logging and metrics. And uh, for all the other stuff, we rather copy it between services than create a dependency between those. We used to make stuff high available by using load balancers. Uh, now we've moved to using service discovery. Uh, I need to warn you a bit about service discovery because I, I think it's an advanced microservice pattern. Uh, do you need it? Probably not. Uh, do we need it? Well, you know the answer. We, we think we do, but for reasons. These reasons are um, we want to have high availability and, and load balancing without having single points of failure. So if you add a load balancer, then that load balancer becomes single point of failure. You need to add another one, then you have two, and you need to put a load balancer on top. So that, that's a bit difficult to get right. Uh, we want to have secure end-to-end -end communication between client and server. So if you have client server, you put a load balancer in between, you need to do some sort of SSL termination. We were using Kerberos, and Kerberos very picky on uh, DNS verification. So the forward and reverse DNS need to match. When you put a load balancer in between, it's a bit difficult. We want to scale out horizontally, which can be done with load balancers, but then you need to dynamically reconfigure the load balancers, which is also a pain. And we want to have some form of automated response to failure. And also being able to uh, move components to, for example, a different data center. And this is also hard when they're between a load balancer, uh, behind a load balancer. Uh, I want to do downtime, downtime, downtime less deployments, so deployments without any downtime. So what did we do? Uh, we, we did a small selection on um, service discovery tools that are out there. Uh, we, we looked at a couple of ones and we liked console uh, the most, mostly because console had pretty good uh, access control lists about who, who, can, who can use what. So let's say that we have a service called service example, and there were two instances running, so uh, zero and, and one. We have a console cluster uh, running, so console is the service registration tool. It's a registry that keeps information on which services where and if it's healthy. So whenever these services start up, they, they register themselves to the console uh, cluster. So console now knows, I have service uh, example, it has an instance of service example zero and service example one. So then on our web server, there's a little tool running called console template, which is a templating mechanism for console. And this generates a configuration file for our front end. So it's basically saying uh, service example, uh, column, and then an array, service example zero, dot entire URL, service example one, dot entire URL. So it knows that if it needs to reach service example, it can go to those two URLs. So then when a um, user connects, uh, connects to the web server, gets sent back the Angular application, then we set up a, um, a, a stateful connection. So this is a uh, server sent events connection, which is comparable to web sockets. Uh, Service Sent Events is a browser standard, but unfortunately it's not supported by uh, Internet Explorer and, uh, and Edge. But luckily for us, we only need to support Firefox and Chrome, so then we can use uh, SSE. It's, it's very nice, but WebSockets will work uh, uh, about as well. So what now happens is whenever a service breaks, for example, um, instance zero breaks, Consoles is continuously checking the health of this service. So if it breaks, console knows, all right, for service example, now I only have instance one and instance zero is, is dead. So console template updates the configuration file here. We push the update to the, to the connected uh, browser. So now this browser also knows if we need to go to service example, I can only go to instance service example one. So what is the result? Say we have 3000 connected browsers. We kill a service here. Within one second or so, all those browsers know that they shouldn't be sending requests to, to instance zero anymore, only to instance one. So this works fairly well in terms of uh, scaling or, or restarting services. Uh, for the backend, for service-to-service -service calls, we use the Spring Cloud Suite. So there's Spring Cloud Ribbon, which has the, the same, same kind of client-side load balancing. So uh, the patterns we use are uh, client-side discovery, because the, the clients detect uh, where to reach uh, the services, and self-registration. So the, the services register themselves. Whenever a server starts, it registers itself to the console cluster. And also, this also helps in, in finding back your services. So we, you can see you have an overview of how many instances do we have per service, what are their URLs, are they healthy? So whenever you, I go to the console UI, I can immediately see how many instances are running on which environment, are they all healthy, or is there something going on? So it also helps a lot in the observability of those uh, types of systems. So how do, you, how do we develop and test stuff? Uh, we, we develop based on feature branches. So whenever we start working on a feature, we create a new branch with the same name as the fabricator ticket. We start working there, and we don't merge it back to a master until it's, it's done. 
So the master branch should always be releasable. We, we should be able to deploy the master branch to production at any time. So on uh, our test environment, we run the master branch, and feature branches only run uh, on, on the local machines and on the CI server. So if we have a system that consists of, I don't know, somewhere between 100 and 150 components, whenever we run this locally, should we fire up, check out 150 Git projects and start those all up? Well, I'd rather not. So we typically only run the components we work on locally. And for the rest, the other services, we connect to the test environment that's already running on OpenStack. So you typically only have one or two, maybe three uh, services running locally. And for the rest, you just connect to the running test environment. So testing, I'd say it's fairly uh, normal. Unit tests, mutation tests. How many of you have heard of mutation testing before? Okay, a couple. So with mutation testing, you um, use a test framework that deliberately uh, makes uh, changes in your production code. For example, changing return true to return false, uh, changing uh, a, a greater than to a less than, and then run a test suite. So the, the idea is that for every change you make in your production code, you should have a failing test. Uh, if you can change something in your production code without having a failing test, then there's no coverage on that part of your code. So mutation tests and mutation coverage tells you a bit more than just code coverage because it's fairly easy to create 100% code coverage without asserting anything. Been there, done that. Sorry for that. So about integration tests, uh, we use Spring Boot integration where we can fire up a um, Spring Boot container inside a Maven uh, uh, integration test phase. We use uh, uh, in-memory data stores, so we fire up uh, uh, embedded Mongo, embedded Kafka, embedded Cassandra, uh, put data in there, and then use REST Assured to test REST endpoints. So if a test like this succeeds, we know that Spring Boot container starts up, we can connect to data sources. If we inject this type of data in the database and then do this REST call, then that this, this reply is being sent. So this gives us a fair uh, amount of confidence that the server will also, service will also run on our test environment. Protractor for end-to-end -end tests because it's the de facto testing tool for end-to-end -end testing tool for Angular, uh, and Gatling for load tests. How many of you have heard of Gatling before? Okay, well, almost all of you, so uh, no, no need to explain. What we do is we run uh, Gatling tests on uh, our most important services twice a day, uh, in the morning and the evening, and then we record the uh, average response times, and we store those in a, by a plugin in a Jenkins machine. And there you, you get this, uh, this graph, um, which is deliberately small, so you can't read what, what's, what's in here. But uh, we have these graphs that, that give the, um, uh, the average response time, well, let's say during a sprint. So whenever there's a peak in this, we probably introduced a performance regression because response times are going up. So during a sprint, we are uh, looking at the uh, response times uh, of our test environment, which obviously isn't representative for production. But the idea is, if the response times in production are okay now, if they're okay now in development, um, then, then it, it should stay about the same. Whenever something changes in development, then we need to look into what changed there because we might get issues in production uh, too. So how do we test feature branches? Uh, so we, we spin up branches uh, on the CI environment and test it uh, there. And if there are any dependencies, let the test just connect to the, to, to the test environment. Uh, and we try to avoid changing multiple components at once because then it's difficult to set up the test environment. If you do need to change multiple, multiple components at once, we use the YOLO methodology, which is just like push it and hope that nothing breaks, and if it breaks, be quick at fixing it. So tr try not to be uh, too, uh, too principal about that. So about building and deploying, uh, we use the open source edition of GitLab for on-premise uh, Git. Uh, Jenkins with a couple of Docker Swarm slave nodes so we can scale uh, our builds. Uh, Jenkins 2 pipelines, uh, Nexus to store artifacts, Sonar, well, this is all a fairly normal Java development uh, setup. So how do we manage all our builds? I think we have currently about 140 uh, builds. Uh, do we click those all together in the Jenkins UI? Well, I'd rather not. So we, we try to create reusable build definitions by uh, using uh, the facilities that Jenkins provides us with uh, uh, scripted pipelines. So if you want to learn more about this, I did a talk about it once for the virtual jug. Um, you can look it up online. There's also some of the pipeline scripts that we've created that are on the police GitHub repository, so you can uh, check it out there uh, too. Uh, for making reusable build definitions, uh, Jenkins still really works for us because, for example, a Maven build is the same for all our projects. Uh, just do a Maven verify and maybe some, some instrumentation for code coverage, but it's essentially the same. So we have uh, lots of build definitions that are all calling the same uh, generic build definition for a Maven build. Same for front-end and some other stuff. 
So how do you deploy uh, stuff? So what I'm going to tell is per service. So this, this is the deployment scope of one service. So whenever you push something to a master branch, uh, it is a release. So it's a Maven release that gets stored with a version number in uh, Nexus. Configuration is embedded in the jars. So we have property sets for uh, test, for acceptance, and for production in the jar, which means that we can use the same binary. We only create a binary of a jar once. This binary travels from test to acceptance to production. And then we use uh, minus D spring dot environment is therefore acceptance or prod to select the right property file. So there are no secrets in those property files. Secrets are provisioned in another way, uh, but just configuration like where to find the database, for example. So we, use, we, did, we, we did use Rundeck and Puppet to do deployments. Uh, currently, we've moved to deploying with Nomad. Nomad is a tool from uh, HashiCorp, which is like a scheduling uh, a system where you have a couple of nodes running that stuff can, can get deployed on. We just say, tell to Nomad, deploy three instances of this server to our cluster, and then we're good. So it's comparable to what Kubernetes does, but without containers, I would say. So if you have about, I think we have about one, 100 running pieces in production. How do we know what to deploy and where to deploy? Uh, we could keep this in Excel sheets, but that probably wouldn't be a nice way. So we try to minimize the administration we do and, and the think time. It should be easy to, to, to just perform deployment. So what do we do? On a test environment, we deploy at every commit. So whenever we commit, it's a release, we deploy. During a sprint, we take everything that's now on the test environment and deploy everything to acceptance. So just for all the services running on test, find out which service is running there, and now deploy that version of that service on acceptance. So we don't need to do any administration, just take everything from test to acceptance. Same thing for production, after sprint. Push a button, take all the services that are on acceptance, and deploy all those versions on production. <coughs> so this helps in terms of uh, keeping uh, a coherent set of services, because whenever we test on acceptance, we know that over there we can check that everything works well together, and um, uh, we can deploy this set to production without having to do too much extra testing in production. But it also gives us the flexibility to deploy one component from test to acceptance to production when necessary. So when there's one service broken, we can just fix this one service and get this through the whole pipeline. So running in production, uh, we use Greylog for logging. Greylog is comparable to the uh, EOK suite, but I, I found it a bit easier to set up and use. It's a bit less flexible, but it's good enough for us. Uh, also metrics provided by Spring Boot Actuator. We use Zipkin to trace requests over services. Uh, Grafana for some uh, graphing uh, and monitoring using Sensu and, uh, and Flapjack. And we automatically loves log stuff like um, which, what is the, the service that this log statement is produced by, what is the environment, and what is the user ID. So this also allows us to trace all logging created by one user to our system, for example. So did we have any challenges? Yes, obviously. Um, so about sharing code, we, we try to share as little code as possible. So currently we prefer to just copy a bit of code to a different service instead of creating a library that both services now depend on. Uh, we, we, we split it our uh, backend up into services and then recreate the whole thing as a monolithic frontend. So there's also something to keep in mind. Uh, think about modularity and, and reuse too in the frontend. Don't be afraid to rebuild. Whenever we, we need to change a service that we've built, I don't know, a year ago, uh, and we open the code base and we don't really understand it, then sometimes it's easier to just throw it away and, and build it again. Uh, it can take less time than to try to understand what, what the service is doing. If you have a good set of tests, then it's probably easy to throw it away, rebuild it, run the test, and make sure that everything is all right. We're running stateless, so that we, need to, we need to perform authentication and authorization at every request. And this can be a bit heavy. So whenever we first went live for a considerate amount of users, we need to scale up our LDAP cluster like crazy because we're doing LDAP calls at every request. So we add a little bit of caching there that these, these user data is cached for maybe a couple of minutes to drastically remove the amount of calls to our uh, application server. It's vital to have teams that can do everything they need to do to get from idea to running software in production uh, within that team. If you need to depend or wait on somebody else outside your team, you're, you're, you're going to be slow. So make sure that the team has the power to do everything they need to put stuff in production. And we have a product owner that's very um, uh, quick with developing new ideas. 
And uh, there was a period when there was the new ideas were flowing in, and we, as a team, we were jumping on the new ideas and working on it. And then after a couple of months, we had three products that were almost finished. So now we try to take a step back and first put stuff in production and finish it up, and then um, uh, start, start on something new. So stuff we like to work on. Um, well, actually, we've already done this. So create cross-functional product teams that are uh, responsible for building and maintaining one product. Automate security testing. If you have any ideas on open source tools to do automate security test, uh, testing, please visit me after the session because uh, we don't have that much. Um, our dashboards can be a bit better. Uh, our alerting must become better, something we're still working on. Uh, Nomad currently helps us to do zero downtime deployments. So that's something that we're, we're progressing in. Uh, and we're still working on making the, the front end a bit more modular. So I'm currently 10 seconds over time. So uh, there is room for questions, but not during the session, but afterwards. So if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to come towards me and ask your questions. I'll publish the slides on Twitter. If you have any questions, also feel free to connect to me on Twitter. Uh, I would like to thank you for your time. <laughs>